Welcome, friends, to a podcast with interesting people. I'm Adrian Sinclair, and today we're going to be talking about carnivore and everything carnivore. As you know, for those of you who are watching some of our cooking shows that we that we started right now, we're, we're cooking uh, carnivore recipes. We're in a project carnivore month, and we are digging really into that. And there's a lot of books that kind of go over that. But why not just to talk? Why not talk to a very knowledgeable guest? And so with me today is Kristen Whitaker. Kristen, welcome to the show. Really appreciate you having here. You are very knowledgeable <laughs> about that, and we are, we are um, kind of continuing a series uh, of podcasts when uh, where we're talking about carnivore, uh, keto diets, and and um, everything kind of revolving the space of healthy eating, mm-hmm. and um, and so welcome to the show, and let's talk about carnivore. Thank you. <laughs> Talking about food's my favorite thing to do <laughs> next to eating it, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> One of the things that um, that kind of started, uh, you know, um, me on a healthy uh, eating journey is a lot of research uh, that that's done in how food is really creating who we are. I mean, that, that's a no-brainer. That's an obvious statement. Finding good sources of food led me to Utah Natural Meats, and we had, you know, Kristen and, and Shane Bowler over here, of the owners and farmers, uh, operators of, 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 of that farm, which is here in Utah, and and just talking to them and learning about how food is raised naturally and and how quality food is, is, is your best medicine. And... Without me going on the um, the soapbox of you for too long, this is how we met through through yeah. them, yeah. and um, and separately I've been kind of you know experimenting with different types of um, you know f- fasting and different types of eating, and that kind of led me into carnivore diets and carnivore eating, and so when I mentioned that to you, you said like, oh yeah, I'm writing a thesis on that. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. T- tell us sure. about how you started with with uh, on this carnivore um, journey that you're on as well, and. Um, um, yeah, and tell us a little bit more what you found out. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not even sure where to start on my journey because there's not any one moment I've just always loved food. And eventually as you age, it catches up with you and you can't just always eat junk food. And right. so through natural courses, I came around to <laughs> to learning more about healthy food. And um, the way I got to the farm is interesting too because I started, we moved to a half acre down the street from the farm and I was this overambitious backyard homesteader. In one year, I started rabbits, bees, a goat dairy, chickens, for, and I was raising all my own food. I got my butt kicked. It was, it's hard work. It was hard work. Hats off to the farm. Yeah. So, But it, it drove my passion for healthy food, um, learning about animals and how they're cared for. Um, one turning point was we had chickens pecking at the door as we're eating our breakfast, and my kids wanted to throw their cereal out to the chickens. I said, don't feed the chickens that cereal. That's garbage food. And I realized... I'm feeding my kids the garbage food. Wait a minute. So I had um, some issues to clear up. So um, then a few years after this, some health issues started popping up in my own house with my children, with my husband. And and I started wondering where all these allergies coming from, all these weird symptoms. And so I dove into, I'm a self-learner like you, just let's read about this. Let's find out about this and, and experimenting. And then and food became even more important. And finally, I'm like, I am going back to school for this. This is so complex. There's so much and so much relies on what we put in our bodies. I need to understand this. So I went back to school. Um, three years ago, I started at Nutrition Therapy Institute out of Denver. And I'm all, I'm this close to being done. <laughs> I'm so excited. So here I am in my final project. After learning and diving into nutrition head first, my final project is on the carnivore diet. So it's funny when you walked in and just started talking about it. I'm like, oh, hold on. Let's, <laughs> let's hear what you've got going on because that's my subject of interest right now. So carnivore is, it's, it's a, it's a, like outside of just what it is, the the political <laughs> stuff that's going on around it is very interesting as well. Aside just from like nutrition, you know, it's like yeah, all these different conversations politics, about food politics, sustainability right? and mm-hmm. ethics. It's, yeah. a, it's a hot topic. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's start with let's start with what you found out. Let's because I'm, I'm really interested in you know you've done clearly a lot of research. Yeah. And um, and <laughs> what are some of the top findings that you found in like with with carnivore? Well, the first thing I found is not to laugh too fast at an idea because um, the whole time I was in school, carnivore kept popping up. As you know, it's popping up more and more in you know podcasts like this yeah. and social media and things like that. And I just laughed at it. And I would meet people doing it, and I, yeah, okay, you know what you're doing, you know, and, and brush it off, and it's 
it's something easy to laugh at. And it came down to, um, after trying diet after diet and protocol after protocol um, in my own family, that the issues that are supposed to clear up were not clearing up. And I was at my wit's end. And it seems like that is the point where magic happens, where people take desperate measures and right. learn new things. So I'm like, carnivore was like a last resort for me. I'm like, all right, let's pull this crazy out of the box and dust it off and see what it does. And actually, I'd listened to a podcast that had Paul Saladino on it, and he... So we have, over here, we have uh, the carnivore... Um, carnivore Code. The Carnivore Code by Paul Saladino, medical doctor, who is a classically trained physician who completed his residency at University of Washington. I'm just reading this off the back of the book. If you're impressed. Uh, that I know. I was like, wow. Yeah, like, yeah just memorize all of that. <laughs> but he is talking about, so tell us a little bit more about this book and what you found out in, uh, yeah. in this carnivore so, Bible, as some call it. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's incredible. And I wish it was, so it just came out. In fact, I was halfway through my own 30-day experiment when the book came out and I pre-ordered it and I devoured it. I I am hoping, and if anyone's watching, I want it to be in the curriculum at school because I have literally read hundreds of books um, over the course of my education, and this challenges almost every single one of them, throws everything on its head. How? It teaches you to question everything. So um, it's... Let's take what Michael Pollan says as the food rules that are pretty well accepted. Let's eat um, eat real food, mostly plants, he says. And this is saying quite the opposite. And here I've been studying all these plant components and antioxidants and curcumin and resveratrol and polyphenols and all these different things that we're trying to get out of a balanced diet that includes mostly vegetables. And Paul Saladino comes along and says, wait a minute, those aren't healthy. Those are hurting you. They're actually the opposite. It's mind-blowing. He turns it all on its head. So one of the takeaways, if this counts as a takeaway, is to question everything. If you accept it as absolute fact to the point that you wouldn't even think twice about spouting it to somebody, then maybe you need to take a second look at it. That's what the Carnivore Code did for me most. One of the things that I found really interesting and it kind of convinced me, and, and again, I, I always preach this on my podcast. I say, like, you know, my own body, my own experiment. I can do whatever I want with it. So I, so I experiment on myself. I did 21-day fast. Wanted to see what happened. Um, I'm doing this carnivore project right now, carnivore mm -hmm. month project, where we work, we're cooking recipes, um, and you know, carnivore based. And I'm I'm watching everything. I'm doing blood blood tests. I want to see what is happening. How is my body responding? But also, like, how am I feeling day to day? Mm -hmm. Am I happy or am I sad? Do I have energy? Do I want to have like all these different things? So like, be your own, you know, investigator, investigator, and, and just try it on you on yourself. But one of the things I wanted to say about with with plants and conventional wisdom is like we were thinking about things like. Uh, spinach and you know Popeye and you know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There you go. gotta just have to your get, spinach how many kids have we forced to that's, eat spinach that's <laughs> right and one of the things that really blew my mind was that spinach and um my oh gosh what's the chemical in it that oxalates oxalates yeah those the, the, that group of, of chemicals that basically um, calcifies uh, you know calcium in your body and, and actually can if you if you do too much of, of spinach you can actually uh, cause yourself or start the um, uh, um, uh, stones yeah kidney yeah. stones so that was just mm -hmm. mind blowing to me I was like wow that's kind of not what I've I've never heard about that. Well, I've heard hints of these things. So here's what's frustrating about studying nutrition. You think you've got a grasp of something and then there's all these nuances. For example, spinach. Um, when I was studying, like the green smoothie girl tells you to sh cram your smoothie as full as greens as you can, right? And then later on she says, well, you should rotate through your greens because if you have too much of one kind, you can have this oxalate buildup. And you're like, wait a minute, what is an oxalate? Right. And then, you know, or if you're studying grains and you learn that whole grains are good, but only if they're sprouted, only if they're soaked to deactivate the phytates. They're, everything with plants has a caveat to make it digestible, to make it not hurt you, to unlock this treasure trove of nutrients that they supposedly have, right? And he's saying, well, why go to all that trouble? Just keep it easy and eat meat. So <laughs> wait a minute. It was almost too simple like right. because I'm a, like, I've learned... Um, how to ferment, how to sprout, how to soak. I make everything from scratch at my house. Like you wouldn't believe how much of my life is just in the kitchen, right? And it's and and I've loved it. It's been a labor of love. And then he comes along and is like, you don't need to do all that just to get a mediocre nutrient content. We have this powerhouse of nutrient right here. And the factory that converted it are these animals. They've right. done all the They've work for us. Done the hard work. Yeah. Right. Um, one of the things, and again, 
um, you know, my caveat is I'm going to experiment myself. I, I I may be doing vegan and, and and vegetarian diets and see how that that works. And we'll talk about that yeah. a little bit too because mm-hmm. there's again you have to really be careful how you know for how long you're going to do it and it has mm-hmm. its benefits as well. But one of the things that really struck me uh, when when I was listening to someone who was talking about plants and it made total sense to me. And and that person said this. Plants can't run the way animals can. Therefore, they become very, very good chemists because they need to protect themselves too. And whereas... Plants produce some things, fruit, that they want your, you know, you and animals eat it because then that's their way of reproducing. Seeds mm-hmm. go out, animal poops, there you go. Right? You it's fertile. It, yeah. Perfect. Perfect uh, perfect design. However, it doesn't really make sense for the plant to to be happy about you eating its leaves because the why the way I see its leaves are like its solar panels. Mm-hmm. And if you if if you know something eats its solar panels, then obviously it's not gonna have as much energy. And so it made sense to me that things would want to defend itself from from being eaten yeah. now you can always say that you know um cows and other you know, other mammals adapt to that they have four stomachs that they can still digest all of that stuff we don't we mm-hmm. have one stomach we can't digest that as as well um so that was kind of my little spiel about like you know the plant side but what i'm curious uh, about is what you said about what paul saladina said over here how did he turn things upside down how did he prove or like how is he proving in his book and in his talks that he's saying like hey you know like you really don't need a lot of other things like yeah. this is really comprehensive well this is what's crazy he does break down all the nutrients and he takes them one at a time um, from vitamin C to B12 to whatever, any single one of them he'll address in the book and show you mm-hmm. how it stacks up in meat. One thing that's interesting, like I could take all of those defenses, all these topics and go with them, mm-hmm. but focusing on the nutrients um, is he, he talks about how Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a complex it's a complex problem and and one of the things that you know you started off with is saying like the animal already processed a lot of stuff for you, right? Yeah. So when you when you have that meat and and also organ meat, all those nutrients are like already a lot okay. yeah. bioavailable. And so not only that is it's bioavailable because it's in the form it translates directly to what we use it. He he talks about Max and PCs and how when you're programming you need to change the format to have them translate and that's plants to animals. We're animals eating animals, it's the same code. We we accept that easily. But what's interesting about this is what it turned on the head. Sorry, I lost the word parameter. Is it changes the parameters for nutrients. For example, vitamin C um, we're taught we need so much of it, especially now we're trying to build our immune systems. We're trying to be protective. Vitamin C is that super nutrient. But a lot of our vitamin C is used to mitigate the toxic effects of plants. Mm. So if you take that out, we don't need as much vitamin C. Interesting. We, and a lot of these plant, this got confusing in nutrition school. A lot of chemicals, they compete with each other for absorption. They compete with each other or cancel each other out or they, they mitigate the effects of one another. So when you're eating a plant that's high in sulfurates, for example, then it's going to block your absorption of, say, iron, Mm. and you're canceling it out. But when you take meat that doesn't have this chemical storm, yeah, you don't have all these defenses built into the programming. You can just readily take it in and absorb it and use it instantly. Very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Um, I just wanted to uh, to say when you said, you know, uh, Max and PCs, and uh, <laughs> and I'm like, you're just going to start a war on the internet. I know, right? right? <laughs> That's straight Plants from Paul me. Saladino, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we should, you know, um, I'd love to have Paul Saladino on the show and, and talk to him um, yeah, as well. What else did you find out that was, like, really so striking that really kind of flip the script on like your conventional uh, thinking. Well, another, what what really opened me up to even give it a chance in the first place, because even um, I got laughed at when I told some friends I'm coming on this show to talk about carnivore, because they're like, that's not what you want to be known for. You're going to get discredited before you even launch a a business. And, and, um, yeah, it's been really interesting. Conspiracy yes, theory that's right. Carnivore. I'm just so crazy, aren't I? I just want to eat all the animals. But uh, what what flipped the switch for me was when he suggested that because every plant has a defense mechanism, there's a cost to eating that. So yeah, I'm not saying that plants don't have nutrients in them, that they're not good for us. They are, but there's a cost to unlock the treasures inside every plant, whereas animals don't have that. So if you are, have a compromised system, like people in my family that have auto, autoimmune conditions, and I dare say we all have conditions we might not even be aware of. You mentioned how your food is tied to your mood and, and your sleep and your energy levels, and a lot of people don't realize that. 
that. So you might be working at half capacity already and not even mm-hmm. know it. Mm-hmm. So if we have um, compromised systems, do we want to be throwing in these complex organisms that we have to unlock and fight against and beat the nutrition out of? No, we want to save our resources to heal and to strengthen ourselves. So we want to take nutrition in the simplest form and we want to get it right into our cells where we can use it the fastest to rebuild and to thrive. So if you have an absolutely healthy system and no issues, no hiccups in digestion or energy or sleep or um, with moods or anything, go ahead and eat whatever you want, right? And first of all, we would like to have you on the show to, to yeah, see Yeah, and tell specimen. us. We, and we want to see your, your tests and your samples. But if you struggle in any way, don't stack the deck against yourself. Take it down to a minimal diet that's easy to absorb and nutritionally dense and then build up from there. And then you'll Find out quickly what's setting you off, what's disrupting your sleep, what's giving you gas, like all different symptoms that you didn't know weren't normal. It's kind of cool. Let's talk about bioavailability. That's one of the uh, things that that, um, that we talked about as well. Like, so what is it? What is bioavailability to you in your own research? How so, do you determine? How do you define yeah, that? Yeah, you know, this is so hard as a nutrition therapist. We're trained to look at supplements, and supplement bottles make all these claims about how many milligrams of this or that, or I use or this daily or that. recommended value. Yeah, and, well, it doesn't matter at all what that bottle says if your body can't absorb it because it's a synthetic form or it's a plant form. For example, vitamin A in plants is uh, beta carotene. It's actually a vitamin A precursor. In animals, it's in the retinoid classification and it's, it's the vitamin A that we can use directly. So we have to convert beta carotene into uh, retinol or vitamin A. I'm sure my teachers are watching this and like hammering me for facts, so <laughs> fact checked. We have to convert that and we lose like 90% of it in the process. So if you're taking a supplement that's plant-based, it doesn't matter what it says on that bottle, you're only taking in 10%. Is that why you, you uh, a lot of those supplements have like 4,000% of daily recommended yeah. value. I was always thinking about that. Like, if it's if daily <laughs> recommended value is this, why would well, I want it to have 20 more times <laughs> or 40 more times? That's another interesting thing. So the RDA is actually, it's a recommended daily allowance, but it's not an recommended for optimal performance. It's recommended so that you don't die. The minimum amount you need to survive is this amount, and this is what we recommend. So for vitamin C, the minimum amount to not get scurvy Mm -hmm. is this. For iron, the minimum amount to not be anemic is this amount. But So a lot of vitamins, you'll thrive at a much higher level. And because we all run differently in different circumstances, we all need different levels. So that should be your bare minimum. Makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. (laughs) It's confusing. Um, yeah, and that's that's something that I always have heard from many people is like bioavailability is like not only what you eat is, but like where did it come from? How is it processed? Like the we, we think like hey, minimally processed foods, right? Like mm-hmm. you know, is it stabilized with any in some kind of chemicals? Like what is it? It's always important to think about in 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 uh, in context, right? Not yeah. only as it's as itself, but like what is it? You know, what does it sit in with as your body's trying to unlock those nutrients? Yeah. So what you said about plants is like really interesting because you almost you have to be like a chemist in your yeah. kitchen to figure out like oh I'm gonna have some spinach, but spinach has this, so I need to I need this in order to neutralize that, and then I need this a little bit more of that, and mm-hmm. then you're, and this to counter this, but this yeah. to balance that. It can drive you crazy. Like I I seriously went to school thinking I find the right diet, the right answers, and instead it became more and more confusing because there just aren't, and it's different case by case, which is why I love, so just meeting you right away, you use your body as your own um, experiment, your own laboratory. Yeah. And it's, if I had a message, I'd be, give people permission to do that. So I work with people, they're like, wait, I have to ask my doctor, or even let me ask my mom. I'm like, it's your body. Right. You should decide, well, okay, I'm willing to, 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 try this for this amount of time to see or listen to your body. How many people don't even realize that having a headache every day isn't normal or um, waking up five times a night isn't normal. They just accept that as normal because they've never thought to ask themselves. They need somebody outside of them to tell them that's not right. That is a Let's ve- fix that. such a good point. That's right. Like what is your baseline, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you're healthy. And so this leads me to, uh, to, to, to talk about carnivore diet as a diet that allows you to, uh, that offers that very um, thing, right? The yeah. re- reductionist, uh, not reductionist. Elimination sorry. diet. Elimination diet. Thank you. It's yeah. using, so 
Tell us what elimination diet is. Why is it important? So um, this is what I just finished a paper on. And, and you, say elimina- yeah. you say elimination diet. As a therapist, we all like clench up and get all mm-hmm. tight. Because when I pitch this at a client who clearly needs help getting to the root of their issues, I know they're going to kick and scream and cry because I'm telling them everything that they can't eat. You're taking out everything allergenic and going down to a really basic diet, and then after an amount of time allowing your guts to rebuild and heal, you start to add things in one at a time to see what's flaring you up, what's causing issues. In that time, if you're lucky, your gut lining might heal and you, will, you won't be allergic to it anymore, and some things might just stay. Common allergens are things like wheat, corn, soy, nightshades, which are tomatoes and peppers, like everything in salsa that makes it good. Um, dairy is sadly on that list. Um, a lot of our favorite foods are common allergens. So if you take those out, you're left with, well, what's left? And there's several, there's several elimination diet protocols out there. And usually when I'm talking to a client, I'll try to match one to their personality. Like, can you handle this one? This one's really hard but faster or this one's gentler but it's a lot longer and you try to find one that they can endure okay and they can get through till they get to the healing part and it's just really hard and it's really grueling especially with kids or younger ones i've done them with my teenagers and they're sad they're hard so the carnivore you might look at and be like well that's more restricted than any other diet because i'm just eating meat but um instead of being like can i have spinach can i have pepper on my spinach can i no i can't have that but i can have this instead of all these questions and thoughts, you pretty much, well, did it come from an animal? Okay, I can eat it. That's the carnivore diet in a nutshell, Mm -hmm. except we can't eat nuts. So, um, So if I pitch that at a client, there's a different person that wants simplicity. Like I could do that for a little while. I think I can do that. Because it's so simple, they're more successful at it. There's not a lot of the pitfalls that come with the other ones. For example, if you're on say the GAPS diet and you accidentally ate fruit before you were supposed to, you could flare up and have to start all the way over. If you're on the AIP diet and you used a seasoning that had a nightshade in it, oh, I didn't know that um, pepper was a nightshade or whatever. So you have to start all the way over with your elimination. There, there aren't these complications on the carnivore diet. It's really simple. It's re- really easy to follow. So just for the simplicity's sake, it becomes a great tool for people who are looking for help. There's no um, confusion. Like it takes it down to their bare bones. So that's where I started with carnivore. But then, um, thanks to Paul Saladino and others and things I've been reading, I learned that it's not just a temporary diet. It can be sustained long term also. So you can so. literally live off of... Um animal products um, yeah. and, and, and thrive. Um, in a recent podcast that I had, um, uh, had uh, Tristan Haggard from Primal Health. Yeah, that was uh, such a great episode. Primal, Primal Edge Health um, uh, uh, podcast and, and his website. Um, he, that was one of his findings. He said he was like in shock that like he always thought that you need plants to kind of supplement because this is missing or that's missing. And mm-hmm. what I'm hearing is that, no, you could literally just live off of uh, animal f- uh, food and, and it, it, it will have everything that you need. Yeah. When I'm helping a client on an elimination diet, for example, if they keep making these mistakes or confusions or setbacks or splurges and it's drawing out their elimination period, you start to worry that they're going to be deficient, they're going to get run down, they're going to be tired, they're going to have all these issues from not getting the nutrition that they need. But on the carnivore diet, I'm like, we have some wiggle room now because you can go indefinitely and thrive if it's done in the right way. And um, it gives them the time to get their feet under them and confident and heal and be able to get in tune with their body and listen to it again so that they can continue a healing protocol. And for some, that will include adding in foods again and having a diverse diet. And for others, they might decide they do better with carnivore and they might stay there indefinitely. There's different levels of carnivore and they might find one of those niches to live in. So it's kind of exciting. And we'll get back to to the, some of the nutritional aspects of it, but I want to throw in another question over here. Why is carnivore why is carnivore diet so hated on? <laughs> it's like the flip side coin of veganism, right? And when you say vegan in a room, like you're gonna get it's polarizing. There's gonna be people with pitchforks that would rather hurt a human than a cow, or um, people that are laughing it off and thinking they're awful. And then you go flip that coin to carnivore, and it's the same way. People are laughing it off as extreme and ridiculous. And then there's the people that are thinking we're exploiting animals, we're um, eating more than the earth can sustain. It's selfish. It's an expensive diet. Um, it's indulgent. So there's there's a range of reasons to hate it, but 
it just sounds laughable. We have been programmed our whole life to eat your vegetables, finish your beans, clean your plate. No one ever had to yell at a kid to eat their hamburger, right? right. It's it's all the greens we're trying to get down them. So it, it becomes laughable when now we're like, wait, wait, don't eat your vegetables. Wait, no, no, get that off your plate. Here, have another ribeye. Like it's just <laughs> opposite of what we've been what we've been programmed with. Kind of like we were led to believe that fat was killing us. And so we were we were immersed in, you know, fat-free everything. And so when we brought fat back, people were like, that's that's ridiculous. That's insane. Right. It's the same kind of kickback now that we're like, wait, we can eat red meat and not get cancer? What? So. Right. Even even like all these, um, you know, markers that are being used as, as uh, metrics for for health, you know, whether you're good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, and like mm-hmm. the typical thing that you hear from doctors, like don't eat a lot of red meat and, and you know, not fatty stuff, you know, uh, because it's going to clog up your arteries and, and so on. And, and I'm like, okay, well... That's a theory. Let's let's uh, that's theory. a hypothesis. Let's uh-huh. let's uh, let's you know let's let's explore it. And so I did blood work. I did you know I, I ate for several weeks on meat and I meat and fat like you know just just eating it up. And I did um, you know blood work again and everything was perfect. Like you know I'm like right in the range. Everything is done. Like my yeah. actually my triglycerides were 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 even better. It's like all these different Improved. things. Were, yeah. So well, there's a there's something to mention there is if you tested right away, how far apart were your tests? It was like uh, almost a month. Okay, if you tested within two weeks or so, they might have been elevated because when you start carnivore, you're you're releasing weight and you're rebalancing cholesterol and things are changing, which means more things are circulating, right? Mm-hmm. So I'll have people that test when they've just started the ketogenic or the carnivore and they flip out because all their numbers are through the roof. But if you wait and let your body adjust, they settle right back down to normal or optimal, even better, like you said. How interesting. That is such an important message um, to thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, give yourself a little time. Right, right. Because it's not a switch. It's not a light switch. You can't just like, oh, I ate a steak. I should be like super healthy now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) I wish you your body has to undo a lot of things and get get up to speed with a lot of Mm -hmm. things as well. It's a real balancing act. I have such respect for all the processes running in our body simultaneously all the time what our bodies are able to do unfathomable and so when we when we do something drastic like a new diet like this we kind of throw everything up in the air and we have to let it settle down before we pass a judgment on it so what else did you find out in your in your research uh you know for your thesis and some of the surprising things that um, i mean some of the things that you mentioned that you know paula salinas is talking about um i haven't read this book and and um I am going to read it. I'm very interested in. in you find, would love it. I, I, I'm very interested in how he's backing things up with with scientific so, research. And, and that's interesting too, because there are not a lot of studies. Well, there aren't any right. studies about the carnivore diet. So he'll pull um, diets more about um, elements, different plants. For example, he talks a lot about curcumin in that book because that's in turmeric, which is mm-hmm. a superfood right now, and it's in everything, right? Right, exactly. And so he'll take studies that show that curcumin doesn't actually do this, it does that. So he, so a lot of his studies go down to elements and very small, like, um, specific components of foods. But then he'll look at other studies that, um, like, there's a lot of information on low-carb diets, and you could call carnivore as a zero-carb or extreme low-carb diet. Right. So he'll he'll approximate some of those findings, and, and then um, he looks a lot into regenerative agriculture and the effects of that on nutrition and such. And so a lot of the problems with the research on meat-based eating is it's done with conventional factory-farmed products, right? And that has a different nutritional profile than what a grass-fed steak or a pastured pork chop or a free-range egg would have. So it's really hard to find literature that's that's looking at it objectively. From, from that perspective yeah. of the, the, the healthier version of. So explain for those who, who have heard about grass-fed, and it is good, uh-huh. grass-fed, but in your own words, why why is why is grass fed beef uh, grass fed beef better than and or pasture raised um, you know chickens that lay eggs um, than like these you know mass produced um, mm-hmm. um, products? Well, one thing about carnivore code is it puts us on a level with animals. Really, it just puts us in the food chain back where we belong. We're predators and we eat meat, and so um, if we're so far removed from meat like we are in our modern system, we don't identify with it at all. That um, we we lose we lose the ability to relate to it. So 
when I was raising animals in my um, comical attempt to be a farmer myself, um, I realized quickly the better you take care of an animal, the healthier it is, the more milk it gives, the better eggs it, it lays with richer yolks, like they're better and then their product, their meats and such are better for us too. And it's the same with us. If we eat better food, we expect to get healthier. So why would we feed an animal the cheapest garbage we can just to get it fat fast and then think eating that would make us healthy? It's the craziest thing. So a grass-fed cow is eating what it was designed to eat. A cow is not a carnivore. It's ruminant. It has a sophisticated um, chambers in its stomach to break down food that's completely indigestible to us, right? That's what it was made to do. Yeah, if you don't believe that, try eating some yeah. some, uh, some grass uh, straight off the... <laughs> you won't be happy with what happens happy. Yeah. to you at Your all. Your will not be happy about no. that. No, and then not only... So we feed them something they're not meant to have. We feed them grains, grains. and byproducts and things things, then we put them in close quarters and nothing should live crammed together in these small close quarters. And then because they're in close quarters and they're eating food that makes them sick, they get sick. So we pump them full of antibiotics and things to keep them well enough that we can harvest them well enough, not necessarily well, right? So the whole model that food is raised under is really is exploiting animals rather than caring for them. And it breaks the connection between the consumer and the grower, right? Whereas if you're in a closed loop connection where you're related, you're, you relate with the animals, the farmer takes care of them and knows them, they're raised in an environment that they thrive in, you'll always get a superior end product. You take care of them, they'll take care of you. And I don't know why that's so hard for some people to grasp. They just see dollar signs and um, they they read hype and they think it's just this, you know, high fingled way to elevate ourselves and charge more money but yeah. really it's it's how it was before we messed with it it's how, what we should get back to the the overarching uh, theme that i see and a trend in, in these conversations that i have with with um, uh, with people in the food industry and health industry um, because everything is again inter interlinked and, and, and related, mm -hmm. you know, health your, your health is directly related to what you eat and, and 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 other things. But the trend is, the profit motive, the greed has really skewed the market mecha um, market dynamics. Meaning, yeah. let's pump these animals full of grains and and corns and, and corn and, and things like that to fatten them up because we're selling things by pound. Yeah. So therefore, a pound of this ought to be a, a equal to pound of that, which is clearly not the case, you know. And and so, but we still, but we have, we really don't have any other tools to really. Um, to really, yeah, to match the value in a way that people will perceive and right, be able to understand. To make it clear that, hey, look, you know, you can get you know 10 pounds of this meat or you can get a pound of this meat. And yet this pound of this meat is going to be way by an order of magnitude better than, than 10 pounds of this. But it's really hard to translate for us as consumers. right? It is, in fact, this is on a related note vaguely, I guess. But the way consumers are taught to eat is how much food can I eat for the fewest calories, right? Like you'll go on a diet and their selling point is you can eat all this and it's only this many calories. But if you think of that, how messed up is that? Wouldn't you want the most calories and nutrition you could get in the fewest bites? Right. Like you'd want quality bites. Why are we shoveling quantity right. crap through our systems yeah. when we should be going for the best food in the fewest bites possible? And by and large, that would be animal protein. That's animals, especially a grass-fed, pastured cow. Um, you've been shopping at the farm for a while. I have the best shop. I get to know the people that are in there. And they all come and tell me, wow, I don't need as much meat as I used to because it's nutritionally denser. And you're more satiated with a sirloin steak, maybe an eight ouncer instead of a 12 yeah, ouncer. Right. It's just more filling and your body responds to it. It recognizes it for the fuel that it is. It's bioavailable. Like you said, you can break it down without issue and it's just better all around. It takes time, though, to um, for your body to because it's again we are habitual creatures. So, like, if you are used to having something that's the size of of, of your face on the plate, <laughs> yeah. right, and then you you're switching, you, you, your mind still remembers like, oh, I need to eat this much to be to be full. So, it, it there is that transition time where yeah. where you kind of get used to like, and you're like, wow, okay, I ate that, and I'm, I, I feel great. I'm, I'm not feeling. Like I don't need to be stuffed to to such a point that like I need a nap to like just sleep it off, yeah. right? And so it is a transition, but again, it's through shows like this, conversations like this, where people can kind of learn like really what are the mechanics behind these things? Why is this better? Why should I get this? Because it's not only that you investing right now in your health, but you're investing in the future of your health 
or what you're eating Completely. right now is going to be impacting you along, uh, you know, in a long run as well. Yeah. Just in my house alone, I keep mentioning we have autoimmune conditions of different sorts in our house. What we save in medications, or what I should say, what we decline to pay in medications because we've opted to treat with food. Right. Because we... Like my title is nutrition therapist. We use food as our therapies. And so you look at it different. Yeah, we spend more than the average family on food. We're not a wealthy family, but we choose to spend a higher percentage of our income on food because we choose to thrive and to heal, hopefully to live longer without um, complications. And it's a conscious choice. Whereas I talk to people that would never, you know, trade cable TV for a grass fed steak (laughs) or give up, you know, their, their night eating out. Um, You know, there's ways to cut costs to mitigate the expense and the investment. And then long term, it pays off in so many ways, not to mention you feel better, you function better, you think better, your moods are better. So I wish I I wish I could get people to to kind of check their skepticism and invest a little bit and experiment the way you are and just give it a try. Invest in quality. It's investing in yourself. Let some of the the extras go if you have to. Mm-hmm. It'll pay dividends. Yeah, I, I agree. Experimenting on yourself, I think, is the the, the most convincing uh, thing you can do because just like anything else, people can uh, can convince you, can 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 tout all sorts of things, but mm-hmm. until you're really going to try it on yourself, you will really not know. You won't know. You won't know. And and um, tell me how you you mentioned uh, autoimmune systems, and mm-hmm. you also mentioned to me uh, before we started the show that your husband is is on a carnivore diet, yeah. like a very strict carnivore. He's very. In fact, so. that's what got me to try it finally. Um, for all the elimination diets and things we've done, he just wasn't healing. He's got arthritis and psoriasis, and they're um, they've impacted his life for decades now. He's lived with pain, and we got him. I'm really proud of the healing he's done just moving to Whole Foods. He hasn't had grains, flour, sugar, anything like that in maybe four years now. I remember even two weeks into his Whole Food journey, he goes, wow, I don't have a headache. Well, who announces that? He's like, well, you don't understand. I always have a headache. It went away and he started to heal. So we had amazing healing just by switching to Whole Foods with him. And then we've tried therapeutic diet after diet, but we couldn't quite get that last 10, 15% of healing. And he's just tired of having, you know, pain. And so I, I'm like, all right, there's this one last diet we're going to try. And I have but done... But you will have to eat a lot of meat. meat. <laughs> yes, which was... I was terrified because he eats a lot. The man is like three men's appetites. So I'm like, this is going to bankrupt us, but we're going to do this. Good thing I work at a farm, right? Um, but I, I have done so many diets over the years because I can't prescribe a diet to someone I haven't tried myself. So we were talking about things we've tried. I have done raw vegan. I've done um, AIP and GAPS and keto. And now I'm like, all right, let's do carnivore. So um, I jumped in with him because I wasn't doing it for healing. I wasn't as strict. So we talked about there's ranges of carnivore. He literally started with beef and salt. Mm. That's it. That's very pure. <laughs> yes, very pure because we went, we wanted to go right down to the baseline. And I, I, as long as it came from an animal, I ate it. So I did eggs and dairy and right. pork and chicken and seafood and all these things. And but immediately he saw results. Like he 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 broke through that ceiling that we'd hit and had more healing than he's ever had. So he's continued to stay on it. We haven't successfully been able to reintroduce food with him yet. He still reacts if we try. So he's just staying the course with just beef and some fish and water. But he feels so good. And um, in my 30 days, I was shocked to see how good I felt. I didn't know I had that far to go, but my moods were better. I slept. I started sleeping less. I don't know if you noticed this. I probably was averaging six and a half to seven hours a night, but it was deeper. And I would wake up before my alarm went off and I'd be like, what am I doing awake right now with my eyes wide open, ready to go? Like I just had so much energy. I I found that um, definitely uh, energy, uh, you know, after doing 21 day fasting where I lost a lot of body fat and, and all that, I wanted to put some muscle on the, on the bones. And mm-hmm. and so obviously that is a very good diet for that to, to put some muscle on. Uh, definitely energy, uh, you know, the workouts more intense. Uh, sleeping, I'd say, yeah, as well. It's just like very... Um, yeah, it's deep. I'm like, I'm not waking up at night uh, as, as yeah. much. And it's just like very, very solid. So, yeah. Yeah, it's the, the benefits I um, on my Facebook page. So Utah Natural Wellness is my business name. If you go to my Facebook page, I, I 
posted videos like here's day one, here's day eight, and all of them start with I'm I don't know what's going on, but I feel awesome. I don't know what's up with this, but I feel great because I was expecting it to tank. Right. I thought it would be a joke. People were laughing at me for even trying it. I'm like, all right, well I'll be part of the joke. I was pleasantly surprised at almost every turn. I had very few like kickbacks or problems. Mm. So let's speak about, let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, it's not a magic pill. It's not probably no, for everyone. It's like, issues. let's talk about some <laughs> issues, right? So, cause like it's, let's, let's keep this show balanced. And especially that you've been researching this yeah. and experimenting for your husband in a way, I think, you know, your husband found a per perfect wife in this, like in retrospect, like, <laughs> yeah, someone right? who lives like, for to so feed reasons, him. <laughs> yeah. I feed you, I experiment on you. I'm going to make you try this, try yeah, this, try this. Are you right. still hungry? Have some more. <laughs> Honey, can you eat some more meat, please? <laughs> that's my life. Um, so what are some, some of the uh, drawbacks? Some of the drawbacks. So um, at first, they're mostly psychological because I'm sitting there like, I want my salad. I miss my vegetables. I want a fruit, you know, or something. It, and so you you don't have physical cravings. Like, it's really good at squelching the cravings. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I, I catered a party for friends. I made a three-tiered chocolate cake. I didn't even lick the beater. I didn't even want it. But your mind is telling you I should mm. be eating that. Yeah. I should have more than just this. So there's that. Um if you want comedy gold, listen to a podcast from um, Joe Rogan when he's doing carnivore and he describes what happens to his guts the first week. I don't know if you had any of this issue, but carnivore is notorious uh, for causing massive out of the blue instant diarrhea. Really? <laughs> the kind of like, so I'm on a podcast right oh, now. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. I've heard that. You was, you yeah. was saying that like he wasn't sure if he's going to be able to hold it in and, yeah, and the, that's how he's going to be remembered. Yeah. I mean, like, we'll just say if it was week one of carnivore, I wouldn't be in a tiny little soundproof room with you because it would be risky. So let me just comment on that. I did not have that experience at all. I, at all. If I, anything, it was the other way. Okay. Um, I, I felt constipated, but but um, later on I found out, I'm just going to comment on this briefly, that people, because the other thing that people have against that carnivore is like, oh, aren't you going to be constipated? You need the, mm -hmm. the roughage. You need the fiber you to need push the fiber, through, yeah. You need that bulk to kind of fill in over there. And it was like, well, that kind of logically makes sense, you know, like to, to uh -huh. have that kind of spacing thing, the fiber in there to kind of give it the... And, um, and then what I've learned, a, uh, actually, uh, my co-host Mike Blasey sent me this, this article about how our guts, just like our muscles, just get really lazy in a way. Because like if you yeah. have this this whole other thing over here that helps you kind of flush things out, then it doesn't have to work as, as, as much. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it just basically just, you know, it's backsliding in a way. And so after a while, you just I guess. You have to wake it up again. Yeah, you just, it just like, you just like training your muscles. I mean, it's just your, yet another muscle. Your body is incredibly resilient that yeah. way. So like. When I'm setting someone up for the side effects of carnivore, like this massive diarrhea or what you'd perceive as constipation, it's temporary yeah. and it will balance out. So I was lucky I didn't get hit with the, the plague either, <laughs> but but that's very common. Um, I think part of it might have to do with how healthy you were eating before. You came right off of a fast. You were squeaky clean yeah. And, oh, yeah. and balanced and in tune, and mm -hmm. I imagine that helped. Yeah. But someone coming off a standard American diet or a high-carb diet, they're going to have a lot of rebalancing to do. It's going to wreak havoc on their system at first. So you can choose either to ease in where you would be cutting out sugars and cutting out refined carbs and eating more meat and slowly transitioning to carnivore and it might help with those symptoms. Oh, or you yeah. can just bombs away and jump in and maybe stay home for a, for a week. <laughs> I was gonna say. Stay prepared. I was gonna say cold turkey, but don't yeah. look up. Yeah, cold I mean. turkey on carnivore. <laughs> that works. <laughs> I know. What a pun of year. We got lots of those. What as else? for the um, as for the constipation, yeah, um, Paul Saladino has like a whole chapter on fiber. He can talk forever, but he you mentioned if you don't have something pushing it through, your guts get a little bit lazy and. If you don't have that bulk, you don't need help moving the bulk through. So it, um, people will report they're, they're constipated because they haven't gone for a couple days. Normally, you should be having one good solid movement a day. But if you're on carnivore, it's really like maybe twice a week. Yeah. You're running, and it's not that you're backed up. You're running so efficiently, you have less waste to pass. That is that is so true. Yeah. And um, and take the, taking that, so that's carnivore. Mm -hmm. And then if you do a fast like I did, oh my gosh. You you think you're like becoming some kind of light being <laughs> because well, other, than, other than going to pee, you're like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't need to poop. It <laughs> How well timed for you to do that yeah. during a toilet paper shortage. So, you're like, I'm going to sit back and watch the world tear. That's right. It's perfect. I'm it's good. Perfect for these pandemics. <laughs> yeah, that, that was smart, strategic of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any anything else that you found out that would, that's um, kind of um, a drawback? Um, well, I did find out you do need to listen to your body because um, 
Paul Saladino notes that you don't need to supplement at all. You just don't. You can get it by eating um, nose to tail. Is important to know. You can't just... What is nose to tail? So you can't just eat a hamburger every day. You can't just have steak every day. You have to eat the parts that we're not used to eating anymore. You need to eat liver and you need to eat um, bone broth and you need to have like the chewy bits of a bone that on the end you eat those. You don't mm -hmm. throw them away and you need to eat these parts that we've kind of become disconnected to. But that's where all the nutrient nutrients are. That um, Every piece of the animal has a different nutrient profile. And so just like when we're eating plants, they tell you to eat the rainbow to have diversity. You need the same thing with meat. You need to eat a diverse array of textures and types to get the full spectrum of what you need. If I you're not, it. you'll definitely you need to supplement. So um, here I am with my husband and myself, and we're supple we, we weren't supplementing, but I found a couple areas that I might tweak just in case. For example, COVID-19, hits and we're all worried about our immune systems, like I mentioned vitamin C, and stress tanks your vitamin C, so I felt like we needed a little extra C support. So I started put, putting some C in both of our, uh, I told you about our greenless smoothie. I lived my whole life making green yeah. smoothies. I invented a greenless smoothie. What is a greenless smoothie? I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, it's, not, it's not as pretty as a green smoothie, but really I just used my own homemade yogurt or kefir as a base, and I cracked a couple egg yolks in there. Not egg whites. They're really hard to digest raw, but raw egg yolks if they're pastured. And then I did a little bit of vanilla Lakanto. That's not strictly carnivore, but monk fruit sounds like an animal. A couple drops of that, and then some collagen powder. So that was just what I did when I was on the run, and I needed a quick meal. I didn't have time to cook something. I'd have this greenless smoothie, and I started putting a pinch of like vitamin C powder in there. And on my husband's, who's just meat, I started stirring some just into his water for him for some extra support. So nobody's telling you there's no carnivore police. It's like you did it wrong. That's right. You go into carnivore jail yeah. now because yeah, you you're, had some, right. you're going in the corral with the animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you kind of define it. I call um I have a free download on getting started on carnivore and there's a page called Welcome to the Jungle because you're making your own rules out here, okay? There's not a prescribed all these new expert, experts are popping up, but it's still largely theory the best way to eat. So some of them will say only grass-fed and some will say it doesn't matter, eat Oscar Mayer 20 Four hours a day if you want and some will say only meat nothing else and some will be like well as long as you're mostly meat so 51 percent is carnivore to them right so you're it's up to you really you're gonna learn Again. the tenants and what works and then you're gonna tweak it for you so and experiment on your own body yeah right it's just like see see what works for you it's funny like and i'm gonna be hated for this probably <laughs> uh, uh, by the um vegan and vegetarian community it's funny how um, you know, if, if a vegan or a vegetarian would try, a, uh, you know, a hamburger or something like with oh, meat, yeah. they'll be like chastised Absolute and, and ousted. Uh, yeah, it's like, oh, you just, you know, submarine the whole thing versus like with, with carnivore. It's like, hey, if if you want to, if you once in a while, if you have a craving for some some kind of a veggie or, or you know, or, yeah. or, you know, fruit or whatever, go ahead. You know, like, you, you know, you're going to come back and just eat meat uh, mainly because it's it's what your body says that it's that's good yeah. for you and and um so I, I do sometimes i do crave like you know oh, i love to have like an orange or something like that mm -hmm. or like i'm really into you know fermented foods I, I do like and it's like my body kind of like i feel good when i eat a little bit of like a really good especially like homemade sauerkraut yeah, yeah it's like that fermented food and i wanted to talk to you about that as well because you're you're a nutrition expert so, mm -hmm. so you, um but i also i also wanted to kind of step back and ask you about um you know, since you're doing this with with your husband, it's, it's, it sounds like it's very, very strict. Yeah, for him. For him. Yeah. What? Um, oh, here's yeah. I'm sorry. I, I had. I, I wanted to. I wanted it's your to, turn to have a lap. Yeah. I, had I wanted to. I wanted to connect it. I'm just kind of like working this out in my brain. I wanted to connect this into because you mentioned nose to tail and mm -hmm. how important it is now to eat just the the, the muscle meats, the mm -hmm. steaks and so on, ground meat, but you know, uh, organ meat, liver. Uh, beef, oh, like heart, mm -hmm. uh, kidneys, um, you know, beef tongue is something that's we, it's still ahead of our, of on our show that we're gonna be we're gonna be cooking beef tongue. So like, yeah. we gotta get oh, it. Oh, you're gonna love it. Yeah. It's so good. So <laughs> how how do you um, manage to keep it? Because it might be it might feel like very monotonous in terms of like mm -hmm. eating, you know, these just muscle meats and and so how how are you? cooking and making these recipes up and making it, um, you know, fresh and making it, um, um, you know. So you don't get bored with it. So you don't it. get bored with it, yeah. you know, especially for your husband. Well, sadly for my husband, um, and 
I need a caveat here. I am not tying him down and telling him, you can only have this, you can only have that. He's largely directing his own diet. I'm kind of supervising and I'll be like, well, maybe we should try adding this and this, but um, he's fairly limited right now. So he's kind of resigned to the fact that it's limited and he has his head around that and he's accepted it because he feels so much better. He's able to do so much more. Mm-hmm. I've seen improvements in his mood. The kids will tell him, oh, you're such a fun dad now. And he's like, <laughs> what do you mean now? I've always been fun. And they're like, yeah. Uh-huh, sure. You know, he's, he's um, banking his enjoyment in other things right now. So food is not his currency for pleasure at the moment. Gotcha. So, but that's very extreme. So, um, for other people I've worked with on diets and for myself, it's all about keeping things creative and changing it up so you don't get bored of the same thing every day. Um, so changing the textures, for example, like I got here and arrived for this podcast and you were just wrapping up a cooking show and guys, they made beef tartare and I got to have some. Like, happy day, right? <laughs> And that texture, that is completely different than if you took the same tenderloin and seared it on both sides yeah. and cooked it up, right? Absolutely. And, and maybe even seasoned it to death with, with uh, too many things to, yeah. to, to uh, take any kind of uh, um, natural flavor out of it. And so, so for those of you, for those who don't know, like what is what is beef tartare? Oh, you're the expert. You just barely <laughs> made it. It's so beautiful. You tell them. I know. It's so simple, right? It's, <laughs> it's uh, beef tenderloin. Again, good quality. I got mine from from uh, Utah Natural Meats. Just want the possibly the, the, the best. The best. You want the best, <laughs> and and just uh, you want to um, uh, clean it, wash it, dry it, uh, paper uh, uh, paper towel. Uh, just uh, dry it, season it with salt, and then put it in the in the um, in the freezer for about an hour, just to kind of have it go firm through. Firm up a little. Yep, and then and firm up because that's the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna you're gonna just uh, mince it, cut it into small pieces, and uh, form a little cupcake like uh, mound of meat, and just put a little divot on top. And crack in a egg yolk on, on it if you want. Maybe a little bit of pepper is what I did, and so good. and then you want to mix that up, and it is just unbelievably good. I mean, it blew it blew my mind how how good it was. So I have customers all the time coming into the store at Utah Natural Meat, and they will be like. So I'm doing this really crazy thing, and I need your best steak. And I'm like, Are you carnivore? They're like, yes. <laughs> so, Step into my office. <laughs> I know. Come, you crazy? Welcome to crazy. We can help you out. And or they'll. Um, so I'm not surprised anymore by what people eat. And we have so many ethnicities that shop there, and different traditional cultures eat different pieces of this nose to tell. And a lot of people come in, and they want the kidney, which I think is repellent. I have not made friends with it yet. <laughs> You're gonna you're gonna yeah, tell me how it goes. Ahead of us. Yeah, you're gonna, gonna let me know. But they it. love it. They've learned how to cook it in their culture, and so I love it's. There's so many possibilities with meat that we're not even aware of because all as Americans we've just thought of steak and hamburgers. That's it, right? You yeah, know, it's just kind of like your staple meat. Uh, when you think of it, it's like, hey, get a steak, get a hamburger, and that's yeah. that's pretty much it. The the organ meats because they are just so nutritious and just so critical in that wholesome diet. So I'm so glad that you mentioned nose to tail to have that complete, just like yeah. And analogy they use like just like veggies rainbow you know you want to have that the the completeness of it well i've always thought there's some experts like dr ken berry and some other ones that are big in the carnivore world right now and they don't they don't advocate nose nose to tail or food um quality like the farm raised mm-hmm. Sorry, not farm. The ethically raised, sustainable yeah. meats versus the conventional CAFO farm. Grass-fed, you know, yeah. pasture. They, they, they wash that out and just all meat is equal. And I think, well, if you're going to limit your food, you're, and carnivore is limiting. Look at all the foods we're knocking off the plate. We're limiting our food. Why wouldn't you want what's left to be the best quality that right. there is? It just seems like a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. If you're going to cut down all your options to just this, then do the best. Right. And it's not as hard if you're just focusing on one part of the supermarket, just the butcher counter, then you know where to go to find the wild caught, the sustainably raised, the free range. Look for the good stuff. Yeah. You deserve you deserve that. That's true. I mean, I, I'm surprised that that um, doctor is, is, is saying that because in my mind, the clear analogy is like, what kind of fuel are you putting in your car? If mm-hmm. you're going to put some kind of dirty fuel, low grade, your car is not going to be performing. Uh, I mean, it's such a clear, logical analogy to me so you want to apply the same thing like get less but higher quality yeah. and 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 your body's going to thank you for it because it's going to have it's going to have a more nutrients b let uh you know uh not as hard time to digest and, and separate things and it does will not have to deal with any potential toxins or any yeah. other impurities Lower that toxic are, load yeah. yeah and better for the environment too so more sustainable um that brings me to another point that's interesting so there are times um 
I've talked about this in the nutrition committee with co- community with colleagues where we're advocating the best and the purest food, but then it, someone with food stamps is saying, how do I eat this way? What can I do? And there's a real, it's, it's almost a, sadly a luxury to eat pure, clean food sometimes. You either don't have access, you live in a food desert, or you just don't have the money for it. And I know just at my house, it's been a real sacrifice to eat the way that we do. And it's, and we're pretty tight in other areas. And so you have to have a real belief to sacrifice to get this food. But what if you can't? Is that does that stop you in your tracks and you're back to your cereal and cold cuts? Mm. So uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, and she's the yeah, pioneer Gaps of the Gaps diet. diet. Mm-hmm. She said, and this was life-changing for me, she said, buy the best quality that you can. Your body will still heal. Your body knows what to do with it. So yeah, maybe you have a higher toxic load. It will take you a little bit longer, but you will, she says, I have the poorest patients and they just get whatever quality meat they can and they still get better. Our bodies are amazing. So from our point of view, our healing journey started before I had convinced my husband that paying this much extra money made sense. So with my daughter, we started her just on meat from the supermarket and corn fed beef. And she got better. But when we switched over to grass fed meat, because it turns out she has a corn allergy, right? So eating a corn fed cow was still flaring that even though it was less, it was still flaring that when we switched to grass fed meat, her healing took off exponentially. She got better so much faster. So I want people to know there's hope for you, even if you can't get to this farm and buy this pristine tenderloin, right? Even if you're just getting the best ground beef that you can, that's a starting point. And, and you, do what, you do what's within your power. There's hope for everybody. I, one of the things how I kind of um, um, am trying to optimize the, um, the price uh, situation, sometimes I do like uh, bison. Oh, yeah. And uh, since, since uh, you know, Utah Natural Meat doesn't have bison yet. <laughs> We've had conversations yet, about that. <laughs> yet. Uh, I, uh, I buy it at Smith's. And my little cheat uh, to, to, to do that is they mark down the prices tremendously when it's, it's given. It's the woohoo sticker. It is, that yeah. That- <laughs> yeah, because people think that, like, oh, if it says expiration date or now they kind of rebranded it to, like, Best Buy and things mm-hmm. like that, it's as if that, you know, piece of meat is going to somehow just rot and implode or explode <laughs> on you. It has, like, this built biological timer that just going to... I think they're afraid they'll eat it and they'll explode. Right. Yeah. It's more of a, again, recommended value by FDA. It's 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 uh, it's more of a risk risk assessment, risk uh, um, um, management for the, um, for the shop to kind of be like, okay, we are absolutely sure that, you know, mm-hmm. but like that meat is still good for, for a long, long time, mm-hmm. especially it's refrigerated and, and all of that. So I get to, sometimes I get to um, uh, the shop and um, uh, the store and I'm lucky when they, it's like day before it expires and they are just chopping it down 50% because otherwise yeah. you have to throw that stuff out yeah. by law. And so they're like, well, we better get something for it than nothing. And so then when I, when I, when I get lucky on those days, when I, when I get in and, and get that good deal, then I just buy Stock like up. 50 yeah. pounds of like, I buy everything. You know? Yeah. Well, and it helps to not be stuck on one. I have people that walk in the store with a recipe in hand that says they have to have this absolute cut of meat yeah. and we're out of it or it's pricier than they wanted. I'm like, you know, you could use this one and it blows their minds. They're like, I can. I'm like, just because it says that on your recipe. Right. If you're a little more flexible or if you're building your meals around the bargains that you find, it's not it's not a big deal to be like, oh, we're having ground beef today because that's what was on sale. Or, right. Yeah. Today we're trying venison. And that's part <laughs> of the fun, I'd say. Um, speaking of recipes, uh, thank you for sharing your your uh, uh, your your smoothie recipe. Oh, <laughs> not yeah. so green smoothie. Yeah. <laughs> the, un- the greenless smoothie. The greenless smoothie. <laughs> and... Um, uh, recipe wise, you know, uh, talking to to Tristan uh, Haggard from from Primal Edge Health uh, on the previous show, and uh, you know, I got connected with his wife Jessica, who who published the um the book. Uh, yeah, shout out to that. Yeah, so that's a treasure. That is cooking carnivore. Yeah, co- uh, carnivore cookbook. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah, and I have he, paid for other cookbooks from big name chefs that were completely disappointing. I read them. I'm like, well, that was a joke because they're basically like sear a steak. I'm like. <laughs> well, I was already doing that. And then you get this book. Like, it's worth it's worth ordering. It, she's put her heart into that, you could tell. And every page is artistic and an adventure. In What, what do you love about that book uh, besides the um, awesome recipes? Besides awesome recipes, I love the context it puts it in because she has some of the history that goes with it. She has inspirational quotes on the side. Yeah. She ties everything into a tradition. So it's not something she's just come up with. You're like, no, in this culture, they've been doing this all along. And so you feel like this world traveler with this view at people inside look at people's lives and it's really intimate it's kind of exciting so it becomes an experience to try 
try each recipe. Yeah, so, so it's really well done. If you made it to this uh, part of the podcast, uh, the in the show in the show uh, um, notes, there's going to be a link to uh, to Jessica's book, so uh, you can get an e e, e form. So if you want to just download it, have it in PDF right away. Yeah, that's what that. I did because yeah. I just heard you about just it like, last week. Right. So I got it, but now I'm like, now I'm gonna have to go buy myself the hard copy I want too. A hard copy too. This yeah. is a treasure. It so. is really beautifully done, and I do love like the history that she brings in. So it's not just like, you know bunch of recipes just smacked together in, in a book yeah. that gives you the history and about fats and all these different things. And, and really good with the technique traditions. because some people um, will be talking and they'll tell you to brown butter or they'll tell you to sear this and you won't know what that means. Right. She's like, by the way, this means that without making you feel dumb that you had to ask, right? I just found She's out really that, good at that she has like uh, a lot of hyperlinks in the book in, in mm-hmm. the uh, electronic version so you can click on like if it's brown butter you click on it it actually takes you through that part I, I didn't even notice it because it wasn't like underlined okay. and then somehow I, found you know. it, I clicked on it and it's like oh it gets okay, better it's, which by so, the way brown butter is like carnivore like a high I was just saying that I'm like drooling it's so good it's my favorite so um, <laughs> my, my co-host Mike and I we, we did a uh uh, brown butter. It was it was steak and with brown butter. It was like it was just so good. We were like brown butter. Like what's the big deal over there? And I think it's just because it brings those those flavors of like the the nuttiness and the mm-hmm. just rich that flavors. Toasty. The toasty. Yeah, it's so good. Mm-hmm. But I always have a jar of brown butter in the fridge so I can you can light up any steak or a cheap cut of meat. Anything yeah. you've got, you put brown butter on it and it's like five star. That is just so that's so, a staple. I'm just so glad that we ate before the show. I know, right? <laughs> I'm like think, salivating. Thinking right is you fed me or we'd go carnivore <laughs> on each other right here. Start that for all my guests. Look, I'm going to feed you <laughs> yeah, carnivore yeah. first. You'll get the, I bet Paul Saladino will come if you make him beef tartare. Oh. Um, on the note of good. recipes, though, some people get overwhelmed. They're they're not chefs. They don't cook, and recipes kind of overwhelm them. So it's it's also important to know carnivore is so simple. You really just need a frying pan, and yeah. you're good to go. Thank you just, for saying that because yeah. um, the recipes, even though everything is delicious, it's not like you have. 20 ingredients that oh, you, yeah. you know pinch of this and pinch of that and pinch of that you go into a store to get like this long list of, of ingredients that you need for these sophisticated uh, recipes mm-hmm. here it's like really not a lot of things that you, you combine together yeah. and, and you get still wonderful wonderful results one of my go-to's is i'll be running to work and i work from two to six when the farm's open and so that's right past dinner time when i get home and everybody's starving so when i leave like it'll be 145 I'm like crap I forgot dinner I will take a whole frozen roast from the farm and just throw it in an instant pot set it for a two hour delay and it'll be done when I get home perfect and that took me less than five minutes the just the time to unwrap that beast so you really can keep it simple especially when people are starting on new diets and they're stressed out and they're a little bit scared and they're it's all they're thinking about simplify as much as you can especially that first week don't even think about how you're going to cook stuff. I have the bottom drawer in my fridge that always has something thawed in there. So I'm like, oh, what are we having? Oh, there's a steak. We'll have that. Or, oh, there's a chicken leg. We're having that. Just as long the night before you go to bed, put something in that drawer to thaw out. That'll be ready. And you're not going to, you won't even be tempted to cheat. So the only time people cheat is when they're hungry. And you have to go a long time on carnivore without food to actually be hungry. So as long as you have something within reach, you're going to be fine. Why do you think that's the case? Why are you not as hungry uh, on this is a good, on, on carnivore diet? This was something that surprised me about the carnivore diet. So I've taught classes on the ketogenic cla- uh, ketogenic diet for years. Mm-hmm. And everything I studied say, says that if you eat too much protein, it will kick you out of ketosis. So I teach this high veg ketogenic method and it's very meticulous make sure your protein doesn't go over here so when i started my 30 day experiment i tested my ketones like twice a day and tracked it and i was in deep ketosis the entire time like therapeutic levels of ketones and i'm eating nothing but protein and fat right so that blew my mind obviously i'm way over what you would call the protein limits for a ketogenic diet and i'm still in ketosis so that's a mechanism i want to understand better um, because that completely went against what what I was taught and what I learned. But um, when you're in a state of ketosis, you're burning fat for fuel. Right. I was going to ask yeah. you, what are ketones and what is ketosis? Everybody yeah. kind of uh, hears or heard about keto diet, but what is it other yeah. than low carb? What, what are ketones? Um, so ketones is an alternate fuel source. So... Um, Back in the you know primal days, we we were able to run on glucose if we happened on a berry bush and we, we ate out all the raspberries or whatever. We could use those sugar for immediate fuel. Glucose is fast-burning fuel. But ketones are what they lived on mostly because 
that berry bush was only blooming for one month, right? The rest of the time they're eating meat and things that were harder to come by and living on fat. And and they didn't have the glycogen, which is the stored form of sugar. So they had to burn ketones for fuel. And we've kind of lost that ability now because how easy is it to get carbohydrates? Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> like they're within arm's reach as much as you can eat Everywhere. anywhere all the time for cheap. So we've kind of lost this ability to burn ketones. So it's, it's like a an atrophied muscle, if you will. But if you go on the ketogenic diet, it'll it'll flip thing on its head. You you minimize the carbohydrates. If you're on on carnivore, they're almost zero, right? And suddenly your your brain goes, wait a minute, I need fuel. Oh, wait a minute. I remember in this manual, it says I can use ketones. <laughs> Let me blow the dust off this and let's get this factory going up again. And, and you learn how to do that again. So it builds what's called metabolic flexibility, which is really exciting to me. So now I've done keto for years, but I can go in and out. People think if they're going to commit to a ketogenic diet, they have to do it for life. But once you've reminded your body how to use that process, it is there for use whenever you want. So I can take a, you know, peaches are in season and I want to eat until I get sick. I can do that and be back in ketosis two days later. So you have your choice and it's a survival mechanism. But now it's something I use mindfully when I'm like, well, I'm feeling a little run down. When you're running on ketones, your brain runs so much more efficiently. So especially when I have a test coming or I, you know, some deep, heavy thinking to do, I need to be on my toes. I'm going to brush up and, and get in ketosis again. So it's nice to have the choices and to mindfully be in charge of what you're doing with your body instead of just being subjected to insulin spikes and, 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 and hunger crashes and mood swings because you're dependent on carbohydrates. That's the other thing that I that I think I really enjoy about carnivore diet. It's that kind of level, yeah. um, you know, uh, stable um, mood and also like energy level and um, definitely no no of uh, like no sugar crash like at all. I mean, you don't. You, you yeah. know, it's like you can eat. You will be satiated by what you eat, and you're not going to overeat unless you force yourself. I mean, you can always overeat, but you will. Your body will tell you like, all right, I think we got what we needed yeah, out of this good. meal. We're good over here. Instead of like you know like oh let's just pack on a little even more, and then you're just like out, out on a nap. Yeah. Um, so, but going to the ketones and you know what I've heard about ketones, how good of a fuel source it is for you for your brain. A lot of people uh, uh, report that clarity that you know the the you know foggy brain is is kind of gone and yeah but i haven't really found out why did, did you uh, find any research anything at all well, like ketones like why ketones are so good in terms of like fuel how you know fuel efficiency for, yeah. the, for the brain well fuel efficiency is the key to that there's fewer metabolic waste products when you burn ketones they burn clean. When you burn um, glucose, you have to take care of all the free radical damage and things that are produced in the process of breaking that down so you can use it. Interesting. And then um, ketones pass through the blood-brain barrier seamlessly. They're like the most perfect brain fuel. In fact, um, it's interesting to me that they're classifying diabetes now as type or Alzheimer as type three diabetes because. It comes from um, an inability of the brain to uptake glucose anymore, and it starts to atrophy as it starves to death unless you bypass that mechanism altogether and introduce ketones, which it could take up all day. So wow. there have been studies, um, the men study uh, uh, was 10 advanced Alzheimer patients that they put on a strict ketogenic diet, and within three weeks, these people could go back to work. All but one who passed away, they were so far advanced. But nine out of 10 of them okay. were able to go back to work. And then interestingly, if they cheated on that diet or they went back to carbs, they Im immediately regressed to the point they were before they started the ke ketogenic wow. diet. So it just tells you like, people think this is like far out there or it's, it's just not normal. Well, maybe it should be normal. Maybe what we've done, somewhere we jumped track and decided to eat cheap filler food and made the bottom line our priority instead of our health. And what's normal isn't right anymore. Oh, well, I hope that what you're sharing over here is going to change some minds and people will, will, will research that. Uh, what, what else... What else have you found in your in your research in your in your thesis? Round it off for us in in uh, any other um, or things that you want to recommend or or like I'm I'm just kind uh, of uh, yeah. looking for other things that because you're like for me you you're like a when you said like oh yeah I'm writing thesis I'm like great research I love it I want to talk to you what well, else did you find out this is it's been um it's been a real journey because I I started out well this is laughable but we'll see what we get out of it to being intrigued to being fascinated just. I can't believe this and this and this. Um, it, there's so much stability in um, diets that are based on fat. 
So you mentioned moods and cravings and just everything stabilizes when you're not insulin dependent. You, you, you get this insulin sensitivity, which is where we want to be. Insulin resistance is diabetes, and, and it's the source of so much ill and expense in this country and premature death and, and accelerated aging, and it's such a heartbreak. And I grew up thinking that you got diabetes or you got cancer like a lightning strike. You were just not lucky, and it just Or happened. genetically predisposed. And yeah, and even if you are genetically predisposed, like you control, control yeah. what's going to switch these genes on and off. So the more I learn about food, the more empowering it is because we have more choice at our disposal than I ever knew was possible. So if you can choose to forgo like a convenience food because you want to save 10 minutes and I just can't with the kitchen tonight or whatever, or if you can choose not to crack open a bag of this even though they taste wonderful and you can mindfully walk over here and learn some new techniques learn um, some new options find out what the heck liver is and what you do with it and and kind of be like we tell our kids to try new things all the time but we don't do it if we could just open our minds a little bit we have more hope and more control and we don't need to live in fear or just wonder when is it going to hit me when am i going to get that test back when am i going to get the phone call um, it's just such a freer way to live. So even if you choose not to do carnivore all the time, I might, it might be worth doing like you did for a 30-day experiment to see if that's something you want when you start to feel run down or when you need a little boost. So it suddenly it becomes a tool in your box. So on my website, Nourish with Kristen, I don't have like a coaching niche. I'm not just working with one type of person with one type of tool. I teach that there's a whole toolbox. Carnivore is in there. Ketogenic is in there. There's all these different ways you can heal yourself. And the more of those tools that you build for yourself, the more apt you are to be able to control your own destiny, to take care of your health, to heal your children, to keep your loved ones with you longer. And that's the most empowering message there is, I think. That's what we're all after. I, I think that, you know, just experimenting for yourself, there's just so much, uh, even like through shows like th like this, when you're when people will learn about it, try it on yourself. See how you feel in a month. I mean, that's like yeah. really, if nothing else, just do that. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't convince you, then, you know, at least you've tried. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, but hopefully it, it, will, it, open, it will open up that gate for you. Um, let's talk about a little bit about what you do, like, in, uh, in, your, in your business. and Because uh, I'm curious, like, what do you yeah. see when people are coming to you with, with some issues? And why are they coming to you for, like, yeah. advice and for coaching? So a lot of, probably usually they come to me because they don't know who else to go to. Because so many people have been to doctors and they just throw up their hands or they'll give you a pill and this will fix it. I know with my daughter, with her, she had gastrointestinal issues, and we went straight to primary children's, to the experts in the field, right? The the highest up that we have. And he basically told me, you know what? There's about 50% of cases we just don't know what's wrong, and she's one of those. That's what an expert told wow. us. And um, so there's all these people that leave just downtrodden, and they don't know what to do. A lot of them end up at the farm. I meet them at the farm. When I say the farm, I mean Utah Natural Meat. They're coming looking for healing in food. They, have, they don't know where else to go. If they're lucky, they might have a doctor that said, look here. And the best clients I work with are working with the doctor and me because we can work together. But so many of are just like, I don't know what to do anymore. And so when they come to me and they, they just want to feel better, and there's different reasons for that, we'll break down, well, what do you eat in a day? How stressed are you? How much sleep are you getting? Let's look at your life. Let's take the whole picture that makes up who you are and see where we can support that and put you on the track for healing. And it's different. It's different for everybody. There are ailments that don't have names, and there are ailments with names that don't respond the way they should. And it all depends on on who you are, like what you eat, what you believe in, how you react to stress, um, if you're social, if you're not. There's so many factors that make up who you are. So you would go to a nutrition therapist or a health coach, and that would be someone, someone like me that would help unlock the code of who you are to find that ideal diet that's going to get you to where you want to be. What were some of the uh, biggest successes that you've had with someone coming in and they were like, uh, oh my oh, goodness, yeah. you're, a di you're a disaster. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've, you would think most of, a lot of my clients will come in with weight loss issues and that's very, very common, but I had one that couldn't put weight on for the life of him. He was just wasting away and his wife dragged him in. So usually if it's a man that comes in, his wife is dragging him <laughs> in and I love it. But um, 
But when he when he called the day he called in, he said, I gained four pounds. We were all applauding. Now, who gets to do that? Usually it's the opposite. Usually someone's crying because they can't lose the weight. And he was so excited to gain it. And just there was so much joy when he told me that. Or uh, he had so much pain in his joints, he had to stop playing piano, but was able to play again. And, that, and things like that make me so happy. Or um, I'm working with a woman that... Um, she she doesn't have energy to play with her grandkids. And she's like, I'm just I just sit there and watch them play and now she can get up and walk around with them. Slowly but surely it's getting better and better. So just little successes like that is the best part of my job. Yeah. Because with food, sometimes they're slower coming. There's there's small ones immediately, but sometimes it's slower coming. But we just get so excited and celebrate the smallest little things. And I'm I'm the person you call to be like, well, I don't know who's going to care about this, so I'll tell you, and I will get so excited, I will happy dance with you, and we'll celebrate, and it's just it's the best part of my job. I, you know what I when I walked in the other day to uh, Utah Natural Meat and and you know getting my getting my milk and my meat and everything and and I, you know, and I saw you and, and we we talked about carnivore and you know I, I mentioned that I, I was doing 21 mm-hmm. day fast you know before and. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of doing a fasting. Maybe not 21 days, but that was an experiment. Again, I wanted to experiment on myself and see what happens. Uh, and the same thing with, uh, but I, I, am a, I am a proponent of doing fast, like a five, six day fast, like every other month, maybe once a quarter mm-hmm. for like just cleansing anything. You save up some pretty money for it, for, for, yep. for, for some quality meat <laughs> and, and, and food. And so uh, so that there's a lot of different benefits. And we, we, uh, we're putting together a show about that where we're talking in detail, like what is happening when you're doing fast as long as, as 21 days. But we jumped on the topic of carnivore with you. And, and when you mentioned like all the stuff that you're doing. So uh, very excited that you came to the show yeah, and, and shared all so of that. Fun. Because it's there's a lot of information out there. But. I love different perspectives and different experiences and what people bring into uh, to uh, from their own life and and you yeah. know how how that's you know doing stuff amazing stuff in your life. So what is next for you in in terms of uh, just kind of carrying yeah. this banner of uh, you know healthy eating? That's a good question. So I. I have the most perfect job now as I work at the farm and I work in the shop there because I'm interacting with customers all the time. It's like a mecca for people searching for healing and quality food. So I, I meet a lot of people there. And then um, now that I'm finishing school, like I'll be done within probably two weeks now. Oh my goodness. I'll be focusing on my business more so that when I'm not at the farm, I'm taking more coaching clients. Right now I just have a few, but I'll be able to open up more hours and hopefully just be there to help more people that are just looking to have more control in their lives. Mm. So um, I'll be focusing on ways to reach people because I just want to let them know that there's hope. Are you doing things only with local face-to-face or now within the pandemic so, COVID yeah, uh, era? Actually, are you doing things remotely as very well? Very few of my clients have been face-to-face even before this. Most of them are calling. And um, so I do video chats or phone chats and we can set up packages. Some people need a handheld to get through a program. They want to meet every every week and text every day and we have we can set that up and some people are like just give me the gist and let me check in once a month so um where a lot of companies and coaching systems are very specified and spe- they have a regimented program i'm really kind of want to meet you where you are and see what works for you because everybody's different in what they're willing to commit what they're able to handle what stresses them out different things or what they can financially carry. So, so true. So it's, you, can, you can give a call. My my uh, website's linked on there. Was, There's a free 20-minute consultation, and you can schedule that right on my site, and we can talk about, hey, what would it look like to help you out? What where, where are you now? Where are you trying to get? And see what I can help you do, and then we'll work out a package. Excellent. So Outside of uh, the whole carnivore thing, mm-hmm. um, what else... Um, what else have I worked with? Yeah, what yeah. else do you work with? Yeah, there's so many things. So some people can simply um, reach healing by cleaning up their diet, moving to whole foods, using traditional methods like fermenting, sourdough, things like that. And I can help with that. I can expand your palate so you can cook traditional foods and eat whole foods for your family. Um, I also do special diets for autoimmune conditions like GAPS, like um, AIP is the autoimmune protocol. So if, if you have um, specific issues that need healing, we can do elimination diets like that. Um, and then I, I can do 
meal planning or kitchen. One of my favorite things is a kitchen clean out, which I've done virtually or in person where we literally go through your cupboard and we read labels together and we pull out what's not serving you and substitute it with things that are serving I you. I love it. So I really, I just love working with people on a case by case and saying, tell me your life and let's see how we can make this better. Because I have a deep seated belief that food can do that. We are, like you said, literally you are what you eat. Then let's be the best that we can. Perfect. Let's, let's get better. Uh, what is the message that you want to leave uh, the audience with? I want, let we've recurrently mentioned this, and you're a champion of being your own laboratory. Let's give you permission. You have permission to take control of your health. You don't have to ask somebody, what diet should I do? Can I try this food? Is it okay if I this? This is your body. You can do you can take chances, you can take risks, you can try something crazy like carnivore or something more middle line like like paleo. You can add more vegetables in, but let's let's put you in the driver's seat and have you take control of your health. Let's be proactive and let's get ahead of your health issues instead of working reacting to them. Well, Kristen, <laughs> thank you for being on the show. I um I think I'm going to leave. I'm going to definitely, uh, definitely want you to be back on the show because I do want to talk about uh, things like fermented foods. And, oh, yeah. and I was going to start that now, but I feel like we could talk for at least <laughs> know, an hour right? about that because it is like well, the whys and hows and all of that. So let's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like put a bookmark in that yeah. uh, for the next show. Tab it like that book. <laughs> yeah. So here, um, yeah. So a um, couple of books that we, uh, um, I guess we're going to put this in, in show notes as well. Um, and the Carnivore Code is what we have over here. Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price. That's actually how um, I got to know um, uh, um, about the um, uh, the farm because mm -hmm. it was listed with, with a with an organization that's kind of listing uh, people who are following these types of uh, nutritional, healthy eating habits in, in, uh, in that research. So um, thank you again for yeah, being on the show. Thank you. This is fun. And Thanks for feeding me too. I will come anytime for food <laughs> deal deal maybe next time we'll do some uh, kimchi or, or, uh, or some uh, some sauerkraut well thank <laughs> you for joining us on the show and uh, you find uh, look at the um, the notes the show notes will will have a lot of links to the resources that 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 um, uh, I and Kristen mentioned in, in the show uh, also a link to uh, Jessica Haggard's uh, the carnivore cookbook uh, which is which has wonderful recipes so check that out and post in the comments if you have any other questions we're going to have Kristen back on the show and we're going to talk about fermented foods like sauerkrauts and kimchi and uh, and um, what else is yogurt it? and yogurt. kefir yes yogurt kefir and all kinds of good stuff yeah so thank you again <laughs> for joining us and until next time I appreciate you being here thanks apodcast.com listen learn and share Thanks for listening to a podcast with interesting people. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review or comment. And support us by sharing our episodes on social media. We really appreciate it. And for more information, visit us at apodcast.com. Thanks. Thank you.